Right, so we're here with the Standard Times editorial board, and we're, we're very uh, happy today and excited to have uh, as our guest uh, Mike Pentany, who, let me correct the, the, mm -hmm. the title, right, the Regional uh, Director? Regional Administrator. Regional, Re Regional Administrator for NOAA Fisheries. Uh, this is a, a fishing town, and uh, so we're always anxious to, to talk to uh, the Regional Director, and um, uh, welcome to New Bedford. Thank you. I'd like to introduce ourselves around the table. Uh, I'm Jack Spillane. I'm the editorial page editor and Sunday editor. I'm Jeanette Barnes. I'm a reporter here. Mary Wooden. Mary is a community advisory member, so we have community members who, who sit in periodically on our, our meetings. Uh, Beth Purdue, editor. Good. I'm Jerry Boggs. I'm one of the editors. Okay. okay. So welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm Mike Pentany, as you said, uh, the regional administrator for NOAA Fisheries, uh, Greater Atlantic Regional Office. And you know, our region uh, spans from Maine through North Carolina. So we have quite a broad reach. Uh, technically, our region actually includes the Great Lake, coastal Great Lake states as well. Um, but obviously, we focus primarily on uh, the East Coast from Maine through North Carolina. We work with uh, two fishery management councils, as, as you know, New England Fishery Management Council, which is Maine through Connecticut. Uh, and the Mid-Atlantic Council, which is uh, New York through North Carolina. We also work very closely with the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which includes all the coastal states from Maine through uh, Florida. And that's on the fisheries side. Uh, in my role as regional administrator, I'm working not only on fisheries issues uh, for our region, but also habitat protection measures uh, and the conservation of protected species uh, that include uh, sea turtles, endangered species, marine mammals, uh, and other species that warrant uh, extra protections under either the Endangered Species Act or the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Uh, our office, as I said, uh, is headquartered in Gloucester, Massachusetts, but we have field offices that span from Maine through uh, Virginia. Uh, mostly those are our port agents. We have Bill Duffy located here in New Bedford uh, as our primary point of contact with, for the port in New Bedford. Uh, but we also have some satellite offices that focus on uh, Atlantic salmon uh, and habitat issues that span from Maine through, uh, through Virginia. So we have quite a broad reach in terms of our, our region and of responsibility. Uh, our fisheries span the full gamut of federally managed fisheries from Maine through North Carolina. Uh, our two uh, most productive and, and profitable fisheries right now, as you all know, are the sea scallop fishery and uh, the lobster fishery. Uh, and we have a number of fisheries that are doing very well, um, very profitable, sustainable, healthy. Uh, but we also have some fisheries that are struggling, as you know. Um, and so my job as regional administrator is to work uh, collaboratively, collaboratively with the councils and the commission, uh, which includes all of the states, on ensuring that our healthy fisheries and productive fisheries remain so, uh, and that our struggling fisheries, that we can take actions to try to get those fisheries back up. Uh, where we would like to see them being healthy, productive, uh, sustainable fisheries. Uh, a little bit of my background, I've been working for NOAA Fisheries since 2002, uh, so about going on 17 years. Uh, most of that, well, all of that time I've spent on fisheries issues. Uh, when I came into the agency, I had been working for the New England Fishery Management Council as a staff person for about five years, uh, which was my position that I held after graduate school. And uh, working for the council was a really good introduction to fisheries management in New England, being on the forefront of a lot of uh, difficult uh, but important decisions that the council made. And being on the front lines as a council staffer, I think, was a really good introduction to uh, the issues, the people, uh, and the challenges associated with fisheries management. It's one of the most contentious boards I've ever covered. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and so that was a really good experience, and it was, it was actually very difficult for me to leave the council off, uh, council staff, uh, but it was a really good opportunity for NOAA Fisheries for me to kind of increase my portfolio of, of issues uh, and actions that I was working on. I came over, uh, rather than being a single issue kind of policy analyst as I was for the council, I came into NOAA Fisheries as a supervisor managing a team of policy analysts that work on both New England council plans and Mid-Atlantic Council plans, so I was able to get some exposure and experience with the Mid-Atlantic Council fisheries as well, which are quite different in a lot of respects from the New England fisheries, and so that was a really good experience to learn how 
the Mid-Atlantic Council fisheries and those Mid-Atlantic fisheries uh, differ in both uh, strategy for management, uh, but also the impact and, and, the, and the, uh, the, the way that fisheries operated with much more significance on the recreational fishing side uh, in the Mid-Atlantic than in New England. Uh, obviously, recreational fishing is, is incredibly important in New England, but if you look at the, the fisheries in terms of how, it's, how the fisheries are managed, uh, we really only actively manage uh, Gulf of Maine cod, haddock, uh, and some of the Georgia's bank cod uh, stocks. Uh, those are the ones that are primarily managed, and there's a lot of really important recreational fisheries in New England. Uh, but compared to the Mid-Atlantic, where you know, nearly 40% of the summer flounder quota is allocated to the recreational fisheries, nearly half of the black sea bass quota, most of the bluefish quota, there's a lot more quota, a lot more a bigger allocation to the recreational sector, so it's a much bigger role in fisheries management. Uh, and attention is paid to the recreational fisheries. So I spent a number of years as a supervisor in, in, uh, on those issues, uh, and then I had the opportunity to be the division chief for sustainable fisheries, uh, which uh, was a really good experience. It allowed me to further expand my portfolio of issues that I was responsible for. Uh, and then in that role, I worked very closely with the former regional administrator, John Bullard, uh, who you know very well, um, and gained a lot of experience uh, working with him uh, on, on broader issues uh, and uh, responsibilities of the agency. Uh, and then and when he stepped down um, after a little over five years, I had the opportunity to step into his, uh, his role as regional administrator, where I've been for just over a year now, a year and uh, two months. Uh, so it's been challenging. Uh, coming from the fisheries background as I did, uh, it was actually a relatively, in, in my respect, in, in my perspective, a relatively seamless transition in terms of engaging with the fishing community, uh, with the two councils, sitting on the two councils as the voting representative for the agency, being understanding the issues and being able to tackle those challenges. Uh, what's been more of a challenge for me, because it's been out of my field of expertise for the last 17 years, has been all of the other issues, habitat-related issues, um, protected species-related issues, primarily the two major issues over the last year uh, that I've, that I've uh, been working on have been wind energy, wind energy-related uh, issues, and the right whale crisis. Uh, so those were two areas that uh, not from my company, sort of out of my comfort zone, coming, stepping into the position have been uh, the biggest challenges, although I think given the, the breadth and urgency of those issues would be challenging for, for pretty much anybody. Uh, so that's basically where I've come from and, and what our office is responsible for. And I'm happy to be here. I know it's been a long time in trying to organize this, a couple of false starts here and there, um, but I'm glad that everybody is available to be available today. And, yeah, no, we really appreciate your coming down. Although I'm sort of totally surprised to hear you say that fisheries management was not your challenge, given our sort of perspective of the long history of it here. Well, it's, no, it's I, not to say it is a challenge. I understand why you're more, saying it's your experience my, is It's there. more my comfort zone. Right. And, and uh, yeah. I think for somebody stepping into the council arena, who wasn't familiar with, hadn't been going to council meetings for right. 20 years, right. uh, understanding how the how the council process works and the dynamics of council, the council decision-making process, the agency's role versus the council's role, uh, how all those pieces fit together, which is quite complicated. Looking out from you know, looking in from the outside, understanding how the Magnuson Act is structured, yeah. um, and the, the roles and responsibilities of various groups. I think. That would be that could be very challenging for somebody stepping into that who wasn't um, didn't have that experience that I did. But for me, especially having started as a council staffer, yeah. stepping into the role and sitting on the council uh, was not of the challenges that I faced in the last year. Sure. That was the one that was most within my comfort zone. Just because we do have a lot, obviously, a lot of questions for you. Mm -hmm. But before we really dive in, I wondered if you could. You have such a long history in this, and it is, as you say, it's so complex, right? And it can be so many moving pieces, what works, what doesn't work, why some things get done when sort of from the outside you're like scratching your heads. I mean, is there is there a perspective that has evolved for you about how fisheries management works in this particular region? Because I know it works sometimes maybe better in other regions of the country. And, and 
you know, that overview and whether in this new role you see sort of that trajectory continuing, if you see, you know, that that long experience you have changing anything. Right. I'm just sort of the big picture curious. I think, I mean, one of the things that I've seen over the years, um, you know, in my time starting with the council through now is evolutions of perspective. And it's been an evolution of perspectives. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's fair to say that six to 10 years ago, the relationships between the industry writ large uh, and the agency were, were in trouble, were, were a, a real problem. Um, maybe at an all-time low, I don't know, but certainly within my, you know, within my experience, uh, it was a real struggle. Um, I think many in the industry, not just the ground fish industry, but the fishing industry writ large, uh, saw the agency as the problem, and what uh, and we've made progress over the, over the years, rebuilding a lot of those relationships, um, being confident that you can walk into a room and not be perceived as the enemy. Um, and my goal as regional administrator, I, I bring this perspective having seen over the last 20 years what's worked well and what hasn't worked. And it, it's my view that fisheries management works well when the agency, the scientists, and the industry view each other as collaborators and partners in solving the problems and addressing the problems. Some may say that if we didn't have fisheries management, everything would be fine. But I'm sort of starting with the framework of we have a law that requires fisheries management. We have a process that's mandated. So let's work within that. How best can we work within that? So within that framework of we're going to manage fisheries, there is going to be a National Marine Fisheries Service. There is going to be a fishery management council that makes decisions. How can we make the best decisions? And I think the way we can make the best decisions is to have open and trusting relationships that we're all in this together and that we share a common goal of you know healthy productive fish sustainable fisheries and fishing communities <coughs> and, you know that's not how every, i think that's not how people within the agency within the fishing industry um viewed things 10 years ago but we're making progress uh, in some fisheries more so than others. I, I look at the scallop fishery as a great example of collaboration uh, where, you know, I've seen it firsthand where uh, if a member of the fishing industry sees a problem, not a, maybe a future problem, it's going to be an issue in, in, a, in a year or two, uh, often one of the first phone calls they make is to one of our staffers to say, hey, we want you to be aware that this is going to be a problem can you guys start thinking about how we can address this and then work with us to raise it to the council so that it gets on the council's docket for a framework adjustment or an amendment so that we can get out in front of this issue. Now that's true collaboration. That's recognizing from the industry's perspective that we are a partner in addressing those problems and getting out in front of some of those problems. I've seen it in some other fisheries where I get a phone call from uh, a state fisherman saying it's going to be a problem in a year. We, we've got, you know, I, I see something happening here that we need to get out in front of. Uh, can you help us work with the, the council and, and address this and figure out a solution? That's sort of my goal for the future, uh, for all of our fisheries, is for the industry to understand that we're there to serve them within the constraint, you know, the constraints of the Magnuson Act. Uh, but we're there to serve them and to, to help them uh, address the problems and solve these issues together. That's very different than 10 years ago, right? So what do you see as the goal of management of the fisheries? What, what, what is the purpose of management of the fisheries? Uh, well, I think the, the primary goal is to have sustainable, uh, you know, long-term sustainability uh, in our fisheries, productive, healthy ecosystems. That, uh, that support the fisheries. Uh, you know, I, I view the fisheries, um, this is probably a, you know, a, a, a trite a, 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 a analogy, but the three-legged three -legged stool, you need, you need an industry, you need a healthy ecosystem that provides the resources, 
and you need markets. Uh, and so, you know, our job in, we have less ability to regulate markets, um, but we can regulate the way the fishing industry operates in such a way to promote and maintain healthy ecosystems so that the stocks that the fishermen rely on uh, are as healthy and sustainable and productive as possible over the long term. Th those three goals would be the goals of everybody. That uh, 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 should be. Should yeah. be. Yeah. Um, and that's, that kind of gets back to the point of um, cutting through some of the past animosity uh, and distrust and trying to uh, reconcile ourselves that we do share common goals. And so what are those goals? And if we can agree that we're, we share the same goals, we may have different perspectives of how to get to those goals, but the first hurdle to build, you know, the first way to build trust is to understand that we have common goals in mind. And then we can talk about the best way to achieve those goals. And some, you know, differences of opinion on how to achieve goals are much easier to address than the distrust that comes from not understanding that we all share the same goals. But so in, in, the, fish, in the fishing industry, uh, there's been a perception that NOAA is a conservation enforcement organization as opposed to a sustainability for the, for the fisheries mm -hmm. organization. Can, can you address the, the evolution of that perception and how it's accurate, how it's inaccurate? Right. Uh, well, I think it's accurate to, to a certain extent. Um, you know, the, the, the primary fisheries management act we work under is the Magnus and Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. Conservation comes before management uh, in the title of the act. Uh, and as an agency, NOAA Fisheries is also responsible for the conservation of endangered species, uh, marine, endangered marine species, and marine mammals. And we're also responsible for the conservation of, of fisheries and, and marine habitat. So we certainly have a, a very strong conservation mandate and ethic within the agency. All three aspects, habitat, protected species, and fisheries, conservation is a significant component of what we're about. I think where we, where there's been a misperception in the past, or maybe it wasn't a misperception, maybe it's more of an evolution, has been the reason for the conservation. There's conservation for conservation's sake. And I think certainly on the protected species side, that's a fair assessment. The, the Marine Mammal Protection Act itself is a conservation for conservation's sake um, statute. It doesn't say you can't harvest whales until they're rebuilt, like we do with fisheries. It says you can't take marine mammals, period. Um, Endangered Species Act, obviously, is a strong conservation for conservation's sake to prevent species from going extinct. But for fisheries, there is, it's not simply conservation for conservation's sake. Because that would be easy to achieve, no fishing. It's conservation with the goal of having productive, sustainable fisheries and extracting those resources. Um, you know, and the National Standard 1 is not prevent overfishing, period. It's achieve optimum yield. And that optimum yield is for the benefit of the nation. So how would Magnus and Stevens provision that says that that conservation must be achieved the least impactful, negative impact on the commercial fishery, how does that play out? Because that, what you hear as a complaint traditionally from the industry uh, is that they are not paying attention to the provision of Magnus and Stevenson that requires them to do that conservation in the manner that is least impactful on the commercial industry. Right. So I think if you're, if you're getting at, uh, you know, the, the national, so that we have 10 national standards in the Magnuson Act, some of which are quite clear, some of which actually create a little conflict. I think that's what you're getting at. There's some inherent conflicts within the Act. Uh, I think, I, I don't have the words in front of me, but I remember um, describing for somebody the Magnuson-Stevens Act, and even in, the, uh, in most statutes, 
somewhere in the bill, Congress states has a sort of a statement of intent. It's up right up front. And when you read for the Magnuson Act, it actually there's an inherent conflict there because it talks about productivity and and, res and, and ex resource extraction, but it also talks about conservation. So it creates an inherent conflict between conservation and extraction. Um, and, the, and the national standards provide that as well. National standard one says achieve optimum yield, prevent overfishing. National standard eight talks about uh, the obligation of the agency fishery management actions to uh, preserve fishing opportunities for fishing communities. And we often <coughs> uh, concern that we're putting national standard one ahead of national standard eight. Um, and I'll say we do, and we, because we've been told to by the courts. Uh, so in some, a lot of cases, you know, we have the act, we have the statute, we have the plain language of the act. Um, we have the interpretation of the act by the councils. We have the interpretation of the act by the agency. And then we have the interpretation of the act by courts. I just want to push back if I can sure. a bit about the you've told, been told to by the courts, but you've been told to by the courts after you asked the courts to prioritize standard one over eight. It was, it was you that asked the courts to, to look at it that way, was it not? Well, it may be that we, so this is tricky because I, I would want to see the, the facts of the case in front of me. Recall that the councils develop fishery management plans. The, the secretary's authority, my authority on behalf of the secretary, is to approve or disapprove what, what a council puts forward. So if a council develops a fishery management plan and the, the intent of that, or the, the uh, impact of that fishery management plan is to prioritize national standard one over national standard eight, and it, it does so in a way that we find is consistent with our interpretation of the act, and we approve it, and then that gets challenged, and a judge tells us that was correct, then that's reinforcing our interpretation. On the flip side, if we had select, if we had approved an action that prioritized National Standard 8 over National Standard 1, and that got challenged in court, and the judge reversed our decision, then that would inform us that Right. I don't, correct. I don't want to stay on this too long, but, but there is cynicism in the local industry about the composition of the, of the council and, and whether it's composed to, 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 to lean to conservation. And so yeah. you know, I think people are encouraged that, that you're trying to break through right. the us against them mentality, but, but the, the, yeah. it does remain in the local industry that we hear right. you know, that, that utter cynicism about the, 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 the whole system. Right. And, and you know, take that criticism seriously, it's a, diff it's a difficult challenge to overcome. Um, <coughs> the purpose of the council, I think, and, and when you look at, I look at this from the perspective of we are a federal regulatory agency. I am not 100% positive, but I am fairly sure that we are unique among most federal regulatory agencies that we have a council process um, that drives the decision making that we use to perform our function as a regulatory agency. The council process unique, is unique in, me, in several respects. One, that it's regionally based. So decisions are being made in New England for New England. It's uh, unique in that it's so transparent and public and people take issue with how transparent and public it is but relative to the decision making process of, of an agency such as the EPA where nothing is public until a proposed rule is published in the Federal Register um, when you consider the opportunities for public involvement and engagement and transparency through the council process uh, for the development of an action that includes plan development team meetings, advisory panel meetings, count, council committee meetings, council meetings, um, all of which provide an opportunity for the public to be aware of the decisions that are under consideration and to, to provide comment on those decisions before, for generally for years before we even start to think about developing a proposed rule to publish in the Federal Register. 
that process is unique in federal uh, reg the regulatory process. And then the third aspect of it is the composition of the councils, where you have representatives from every state um, representing the state's interest, as well as members of the public who have some degree of experience, uh, expertise, and knowledge of the issues that the council wrestles with. We could certainly quibble over what is the best composition for any given council, and it's something that we, that we deal with across, you know, nationally. Um, we often hear concern that the Middle Atlantic Council, for example, doesn't have sufficient recreational uh, representation on it. Um, we hear that on New England, this is for the New England Council as well. Um, but the decision-making process in terms of the fact that we're involved, directly involving um, members of the public and representatives of the states, and the federal agency, NOAA Fisheries, has one vote of 18 on the New England Council and 21 on the Mid-Atlantic Council, I think really shows how the voice of the council dominates over the voice of the <coughs> agency. Is there any cross uh, that's okay. Would, would you call it an effective process, though? Because it's funny when we talk to the council, sometimes we often feel as if they're deferring to NOAA, but yet you're saying it comes from them, and it's sort of... There is there is a degree of, of defer, I guess, deferral. One of the things the councils don't want to do is spend a lot of time, energy, money, staff resources to put together a plan that's going to be disapproved. So one of the questions that, that I get is, is this approvable? Is this package of actions approvable? It's not a question that I like to get, uh, but it is, a, it is a fact that it's a question that we get. And there are times when we have had concerns, we the agency have had concerns that direction a council is going down for particular action. Uh, it looks like they're going down a road where approvability is going to be a challenge, going to be called into question. And it may be uh, something in terms of they don't have a strong enough rationale for the position that they're taking. They don't have a broad enough range of alternatives. If there was something else that they should have considered to comply with certain provisions of of the National Environmental Policy Act, for example, uh, or to take into account the economic effects of an action. And so we will weigh in when we see the council going down that path, that approvability will be, could be an issue. And I think that's where you'll see def the council deferring to the agency of not wanting to, not wanting to spend resources and time going down a path that's going to result in a, in a disapproval. And I view that as our role is to collaborate with them and help them so that that's not an issue, that we've got a good suite of alternatives that the council can select from that will achieve the goals and objectives that they've set for themselves, but also comply with the requirements of the laws that we have to that meet the review standard. Uh, so within that, within the, within the sort of parameter of you've got a range of alternatives, any of which would meet your goals and objectives and are most likely approvable, I have one, one vote of 18 or 21. But I do have a strong voice when we have the perspective that the path they're going down. <coughs> and I can see that balance shifting depending on who's in your role. Right. Um, Jim, you mentioned that the Middle Atlantic Council has the most input from the public. Work on that relationship with the industry. Something you have in mind. So one of the things that I started um, doing, and, and so when, if you recall, when John Bullard stepped into the role, kind of from the outside, although it, you know he was an insider in certain respects and an outsider in other respects, uh, he did this kind of road show. He went from started up in Maine. He did a number of uh, little town hall meetings, um, and I think that was really good for him to get outside of the kind of New Bedford area and hear from stakeholders from Maine down through Virginia and North Carolina about what issues they saw with, that we're seeing with fisheries management and what, what their concerns were. Uh, I didn't take that same approach. 
uh, for two reasons. One was I took a lot of time and resources um, to pull off. And I felt that if I didn't already know some of the major issues that fishermen in Virginia or Maine uh, were confronting, then I probably wasn't the right person for the job, given that I had spent nearly 20 years at that point in fisheries, working on fisheries issues. So instead what I did was I so still- didn't come from New Bedford. <laughs> true. Um, I did make trips. I came to New Bedford, I, I went uh, to, to many ports uh, and met with fishermen, met with dealers, met with people involved in fisheries management. But rather than a town hall scenario where, uh, you know, where I would be sitting at a, at a table or in a chair at the front of a big room and there would be 30, 20, 10, 50 people in a room uh, getting to the mic and stating their, their concerns. Um, I held much more informal meetings where I could sit down in a small group like this or one-on-one -on -one with people, most of them already knew me, but, but some people had heard of, knew of me, but hadn't met me. Um, and we spent, you know, 10 minutes to two hours talking through um, their particular issues. Uh, and my goal was to make those contacts with people, uh, many of whom I knew, but some I hadn't, but make the contacts as regional administrator as, a, as opposed to my old, my old positions, um, and make sure that they knew that the lines of communication were still open, and that I wanted to be able to talk to them, and, they, and I wanted them to feel comfortable coming to me, whether it's at a meeting, uh, or a phone call, um, or through an email, and come to me and let me know what their concerns were, and feel comfortable that I would listen, that I would be available, uh, and that it was my goal to open and maintain good, strong lines of communication with the industry. So I've worked hard within my constraining schedule. As, as you know, my, my schedule is very tight supporting two councils and a commission and a number of other uh, organizations. I, I spend quite a bit of time on the road every month. Um, but when I can, I've, I've made that effort to get out uh, and meet with people. Um, one of the things that I started doing um, at most council meetings, although I don't get to do it at every council meeting, is kind of at the end of one of the days, usually the, the two se first or second day of the meeting, um, I'll make an announcement on the mic before we break that I'm going to you know, basically stick around at the end of the of day. And anybody in the audience that has any concerns or issues and wants to come up and chat with me, I'm available. And the, the goal of all of this is to be available for the industry, for members of the community, to, to feel comfortable coming to me and sharing their insights and sharing their concerns with me. And so that's my goal, I think, to, to your question, is to, is to maintain that and expand that so that I, I have a broader universe of people that know me uh, and feel comfortable coming to me and talking with me about, about issues. Have you had a chance to spend much time with the support industries in New Bedford, uh, the um, fish processing houses, the, the fish gear, you know, repairs and mm -hmm. things? So like I, that. I was down here, I think it was a whole year ago, but it was last Spring, I came down, and uh, you know, I, I did probably the highlight tour. I went to the to the auction, and I went to Foley, and I went to Atlantic Red Crab, and um, got to a gear place. And when I was I was in Point Judith, we went to one of the gear gear shops there, and so I try to get out and about um, when I can. So one of the longstanding um, disputes we have that we hear down here mm -hmm. is. It's our science versus their science, and our science is just as good, but it's dismissed. And you hear that anecdotally most often with Kevin Stokesbury's mm -hmm. invention of the scallop uh, uh, measuring uh, uh, device, whatever you want to call it, that is able to, to was able to convince uh, Noah that that, the, that that was provide a more true measure of the scallop, the state of the scallops down there, and he's invented this second device that allegedly measures ground fish and the, the perception is that they haven't been as open to um, uh, implementing that and that some of the science that is obtained from the monitoring um, ships that go out there is very imprecise and yet NOAA has relied on that religiously and but it's not open to their science. How is, 
what, what, is your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that, you know, I, mean, I think, as you probably know in, you know, in media, it's, it can be a challenge to overcome perceptions once they get rooted. And, you know, Kevin, I've known Kevin for a long time and I'm a big supporter of his work. I think he's done incredible, uh, you know, and groundbreaking work, uh, particularly on some new survey techniques. Um, Kevin's work is not dismissed. I mean, 20 years ago, there may have been some issues as we were looking to expand how um, we assess the scout resource. Um, but, but Kevin's work is fully integrated now in the assessment process. As a scout. On scouts. So to suggest that there's their, you know, our science and their science and the two never meet, I mean, we, we fully integrate Kevin's work and others through the Scallop RSA program um, as part of that survey. Now Kevin's work on the, the, uh, the cot end, open cot end video trawl survey, uh, I've seen Kevin present on that several times and, you know, I would want to check with Kevin on this, but the last time he talked <coughs> about this, he's, he's said there's more work to be done. This isn't ready for prime time. Um, but it's incredibly promising. And I think it's incredibly promising on a couple of levels. One, uh, it's a new survey tool that can be used that is non-destructive. And that if you've got an open cot, even our survey, you're catching fish dumping them out on the deck of a boat to process and count and weigh fish. Uh, Kevin's method with an open cot and video trawl um, is non-destructive. You're not harvesting any fish. Now they do some ground truthing where they close the cot end to, to validate the, the video. Um, but that is really promising from that perspective. It's also really promising in the perspective that the technologies that Kevin is utilizing to look at video and identify fish to the species uh, and estimate the size of those fish is incredibly promising as well. That's groundbreaking. Uh, and that's, I think, the future for not just survey technologies, but also for um, fishery, for fishing vessel monitoring, uh, where we can, as, as we've started to do, we've looked at opportunities for electronic video monitoring. Uh, as an alternative to human observers. Yeah, talk more about that. Um, so let me just finish my thought there, that, that, the, that the work that Kevin is doing and that his <coughs> team are doing in terms of that species identification using on video is really promising, as I said, not just for surveys, but also for the future of electronic monitoring, where we don't want to have to rely on humans to review videotape to identify species. If that can be automated through computer systems and artificial intelligence and machine learning, whatever the appropriate terminology is, uh, that's really promising because that can drive the costs down significantly. So Kevin's work is important. Um, we, you know, I just want to continue kind of on this thread. Uh, there are a number of fisheries where uh, we use fishery dependent data. Uh, there's an effort by uh, the New England Council working with a team of scientists, internal, external fishermen as well looking at how uh, fishery dependent data, which is the, the information we collect from fishermen, uh, can be incorpor better incorporated and reflected in the stock assessments. Whether it's a catch per unit effort index that helps scale the survey information, uh, or other measures that can be used um, from information that fishermen collect normally, that they provide to us, that can be used to better inform the stock assessments. That effort, I think, has is promising as well. That they haven't, uh, we, you know, we haven't, we haven't uh, really harvested the fruit of that yet. Um, but it's, it's work that's ongoing, and there are certainly a number of industry-based surveys that are done um, that inform the science. Uh, probably the most successful of all is, is the, the NEMAP survey uh, that Jimmy Rule, a fisherman from um, North Carolina. Uh, has worked on for a number of years where we use his vessel to fish and conduct surveys using the same net as the Bigelow, um, but his vessel is able to get into to places where the Bigelow doesn't. So it's more of an insurance <coughs> survey to supplement the, the Bigelow uh, survey. Um, but it's done on a fishing vessel uh, run by, uh, you know, 
some of the most experienced fishing captains on the East Coast, uh, experienced and knowledgeable fishing captains. So we are using science data collected not just by the Bigelow, um, but that being said, when you're looking at the scale of our entire region, Canadian waters down through North Carolina, um, the biggest tool, the biggest survey, the biggest data set uh, is the Bigelow and the, the fishing, sur the fishery surveys that it conducts, uh, you know, twice a year. Uh, it's the only tool that we have that can cover that entire region. But th um, there are some, and there's some, a lot of limitations. There are some serious concerns about the data it collects. Well, there's limitations right. of of the fact that because of the the expense of running such a large ship. Um, you can't survey, you know, we can't survey an infinite number of points. They have to constrain the, the number of points. They have to con constrain how they survey, how long the toes are. Um, and it doesn't necessarily match up with the expectations uh, of a fisherman who knows a very small area very well. And they look to see, okay, well, I know there's a lot of fish in my area. But the Bigelow hasn't surveyed here because the Bigelow is surveying someplace 50 miles away. I recently saw a map, and it was in the context of data collection and putting data, like uh, IoT sort of engine and things, data collectors on fishermen, and it was a saturation map of the entire East Coast. And the entire, I don't remember the lowest point, but if you really got into New England, all the way to the Canadian line, right, it was completely, every, you're talking about hitting every point. It was every point was touched on from traffic from New Bedford Port and the saturation level was really deep and they were talking about this ability to almost crowdsource the data mm -hmm. through this. Does Noah see that coming? Do you, do you support that sort of shift? And well I think, yeah, I, mean, I think that's the shift to fishery dependent data. It's, it's, it's looking for those opportunities to have data coming from fishermen that can be fully incorporated into the stock assessment. Is there significant financial investment to make that happen? Would NOVA support something like that? Does it do that type of work in terms of setting up an infrastructure like that? Well, I think we have an infrastructure in terms of we're collecting the data now, we're processing the data now. The question is what data are we collecting and how are we processing it? And is it, does it re effectively meet reliability standards? Is it, in, you know, is it, can it be verified, validated? Um, what level of confidence do we have that the data being reported reflect reality? And it's, that's probably one of the fundamental problems and, and, and struggles that we have uh, and, and why we, we wrestle with this issue of SC monitors in the ground fish fishery versus electronic monitoring and that whole struggle on the, it's, it's really, a, you know, it's, it comes to, it's highlighted in the ground fish fishery uh, but you don't hear about it quite as much in, in a lot of our other fisheries. Um, but we certainly need <coughs> independent data, we need verifiable data, whether it's from the fishing industry or from surveys or, or other sources. Um, you talked about the three-legged stool, and, and I'm in the financial industry, so I'm probably as highly regulated as anybody else is. <coughs> but Jack's question in, in your answer, <coughs> when you were talking about eight different items, you know, where it goes. It, it, it comes down to weighing some of those items. In, in that if, if we all agree that there's the, eight, you mentioned the eight items, I don't know if there's more than that. There's 10, well, the ten. National Sanity of the 10. <coughs> um, but if you weigh a certain number of the 10 higher than Jack does, that, that, that brings conflict right. as to where it is. Courts have a certain ruling, and I understand that, but when we have the different weights, who, who, who is the arbiter of whether one should be weighed more than eight? Right. The I understand the court situation there, but they didn't rule on everything. Right. Um, so until that gets resolved, you just have natural conflict. Yes. And then, but natural conflict brings the lack of trust, lack of credibility. So you can't get where you want to go without everybody agreeing that this leg of the three-legged stool is weighed higher than this leg. Um, how do you how do you help to resolve your importance versus Jack? I'm just using Jack as an example of the fishing industry. How do you 
how do you get that? I mean, you're going to do it by talk, but how do you get right. there? So I think, I mean, you're correct. In, you know, you're, you're, you're as correct as you can be that decisions that are made, I won't say we make, decisions that the council process, the fishery management process that, we, that are, are made through that process result in conflict. It's very rare that a decision is 100% supported by mm -hmm. all stakeholders. I've seen, and, and I think that's one of the fundamental challenges are the, are the inherent conflicts. We, we tend to talk about the conflicts being between the economics of the fishery and conservation. But the conflicts are much more specific than that and much more complicated than that. There are conflicts between the limited access general category fleet that fishes in southern New England for scallops and the limited access big boat fleet out of New Bedford. Decisions that the council confronts that one group perceives as, as, as providing being more favorable to the other, you know, to the other group. That's a conflict. Uh, the council process is one that is devised to understand those conflicts, right? So that's the public transparent aspect of it. The opportunity for these various groups to come to before the council and express their concerns. And then the council, it's up to the council to weigh all of those uh, and make the best decision possible. It's, it's public policy of weighing concerns and making a decision that the council members believe is the best possible decision to address the concerns and address the issues. Someone goes away on that. Whether that creates an, um, a conflict that we can never resolve or you know, an unresolvable distrust is, is something that we hope to avoid. Mm -hmm. and, and that gets back to the earlier point about understanding that we share common goals, but we can disagree on how to achieve those goals. But it fundamentally, I think, distrust comes from not understanding that we share the same goals. Is there a mechanism to change the composition of the council if it needs to be to add more recreational, to, yes. to uh, add more uh, ground fish versus scallop? Yep. There a, so a mechanism. How, how does that happen? Yep. So um, for those of you who don't, who don't know, I, I, I'm <coughs> sorry if I'm saying things in these explanations that are old news to everybody because of how familiar you are with the fishing, uh, with the fishery management process. Um, but other than the state directors, state fishery management directors that sit on the council by virtue of their position. Uh, the other members of the council are appointed. They're appointed by the Secretary of Commerce based on recommendations from their state governors. So each New England state has one what we call an obligatory member, which means that there are, you know, the, the five obligatory members, there has to be one from each state. Including from what? No, okay. the, the mm. five coastal states. Um, and then there are at-large members. There's a certain number of at-large. I don't have the, the number of them off of four or five. Uh, that can come from any state. Now, traditionally, you look at the you know at-large members tend to be from certain ports, certain certain state, um, but they can technically come from from any state. And the obligatory members have to come from that particular state. So, and those uh, so. Every year, there's a certain number of council seats that are up for appointment or reappointment. And the governors, each state has its own process for soliciting interest or nominees uh, from among its citizens. Um, the states can decide, the governor's offices could decide, this year, we really want to make sure that we've got recreational fishing, uh, recreational fishing interest representing our state. The state of Connecticut, for example, has for the last 20 something years decided that its obligatory member is going to be somebody representing the, from, that comes from the conservation uh, community. Uh, so we've had, you know, for as long as I've been involved in the New England Council, uh, there was a conservation oriented person who sat on the council representing Connecticut. Um, that's really but, interesting. But the governors have that discretion to, to promote and s decide how they're going to solicit, who they're going to solicit, and who they're going to nominate. They nominate three, sometimes more, but at least three people 
uh, for each council seat that they're uh, they have an opportunity. How, how big is the Connecticut for? fishery? And they, 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 that vote is equal to a vote from someone from Maine or, or Massachusetts. Yes. Yes. How big is the Connecticut fishery? Uh, for ground fish, there's a handful of votes. Uh, you know, but it's it's that's why I think you probably see some of the at-large members being dominating from Maine and Massachusetts. Connecticut has their one obligatory seat, but they, as far as I recall, they haven't ever had any uh, at-large representatives. So, so, so a governor will will um, choose how you know the governor's office will choose how they want to solicit uh, nominees or, or, or recommendations, uh, and they'll put forward a slate of candidates to the agency. Uh, usually, uh, when I see these letters, they're usually in rank order. Our top choice is X. Our Second choice is Y, and our third choice is Z. Here's why. Here's what we feel candidate X, Y, or Z uh, brings to the process and represents our state. And then the agency provides a recommendation to the Secretary of Commerce whether to accept the uh, governor's top choice effectively, uh, or if we have some concerns about the top choice and why we might want to promote the, the second choice. One of the things that we look at, we do look at the balance of recreational, uh, commercial and what we call other, which would be rec which would be people from an academic or a scientific background uh, or a conservation background. You have to approve them. Uh, the Secretary of Commerce does the does the selections, the appointments, um, but it's influenced quite heavily by the recommendations of the of the governor. So, so how would the composition change? Um, so th obviously, there's people coming in and people going out, right. but. I'm talking about the structure, so I say to, to, to give, um, <laughs> I'll just use this example because you raised it, to give Connecticut less weight and, right. and Maine more weight, you know, or, 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 or commercial more weight and recreation is less. I'm not right. recommending that. So, I, so, I think, yeah, so I think to your first question about Connecticut versus Maine, um, I think that would be a statutory change. That would be a change to the act that uh, Increases it. We have one op one option would be to increase the number of voting members on the, of the New England Council. I mean, the statute dictates how many voting members each council uh, has, and how many at large and how many obligatory uh, each state receives. So, a statutory change could result in increasing the number of voting members of New England from 18 to say 20 or 21, and then it could assign. Uh, in the act, it could say Massachusetts will get an additional obligatory member, Maine will get an additional obligatory member. Statutory at the federal level. Yes, I mean this is con this is a, this is a a going through this is going through Congress. Yeah. yeah, this is a reauthorization. This will be a reauthorization of the Magnuson Act going through <laughs> Congress okay. and being signed by so the president. Just to be authorized, it's not going to happen. Not the uh, so, <laughs> so I just wanted you to have that context. Um, in terms of the balance of commercial recreational, if uh, so, right now we have. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think uh, um, so remember. So right now the New Hampshire representative um, is a, a charter, runs a charter fishing vessel operator. <coughs> say he represents the recreational industry. We have a member from Rhode Island who is a charter captain. He represents, let's say he, he is in the R category for recreational. Um, when his seat is up for uh, reappointment if the fishing industry from Rhode Island, I think this would be the most logical, most likely way it would happen, the fishing industry from, the commercial fishing industry from Rhode Island were to lobby the governor's office and say, when this seat comes up for reappointment, we would really like if instead of another recreational person nominated to that seat, that it be another commercial representative. Right now they have uh, Eric Reed comes from the commercial industry, uh, and they have Rick Bellavance from the rec recreational fishery. Those are the two Rhode Island voting members. So if the industry and others were to lobby the governor's office and say, we want you to nominate three commercial, three people from the commercial industry, and the governor accepted that recommendation from their uh, citizens, then what the Secretary of Commerce would get is a slate of candidates from Rhode Island from the commercial industry. So do Maine and Massachusetts, which have by far the biggest fisheries, have Waited. Um, yeah. no. This is fine, but we're running out of time, and there are a bunch of issues sure. that we haven't got into. So I, I for, go ahead and finish your question, but then we'll just yeah. sort of. So every so I think 
the bottom line is at one, one person, one vote. Every seat of those 18 voting members of the New England Council, 21 of the Mid-Atlantic Council, is a vote. There are a lot of challenges facing the fishing industry, and it's so vibrant and important to this city. So we do have a lot of concerns, and we'd love to know sort of where you see things changing, coming. Um, there, are, there is a bunch we could mention, but let, what if we start with offshore uh, wind and some of the conflict, particularly that conflicts that seem to threaten the scallop industry. I mean, we're so used to the ground fishing industry having right. so many woes, but scallop, that sort of is shaking the ground a bit for us. And I'm wondering what you're seeing happening, where you, if you see you know, his role in this or not. And so I can try to try to uh, clarify you know, our role um, and some of the issues that we see. So uh, first, I think it's important to understand kind of legally what our role in jurisdiction is. We are not a decision-making agent in this process for the selection, siting, or development, or, or, or construction of wind energy. Um, our role, officially, <coughs> is to consult on potential impacts to essential fish habitat. The Magnuson Act gives us that authority. Any federal agency that is going to issue a permit or conduct a project that has the potential to adversely affect essential fish habitat as we've designated. Essential fish habitat, but also the sustainability of the fishing industry? No, no. I'm, ge I'm getting okay. to that. All right. So essential fish habitat, it's very specific. Uh, an agency, so in this case it would be BOEM, must consult with us on their impacts, potential impacts of their action on essential fish habitat. We, prof we provide a consultation focused on the Im habitat impacts, which the federal agency, to be not too you know, fine a point on it, can ignore. There is not a lot of teeth in the Magnuson Act in terms of what if the federal, the action agency, disagrees with our consultation and our recommendations. Under the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act, we have a rule that has more teeth. We have to consult on the potential impacts to endangered species on any federal action. If we find that the federal action may jeopardize an endangered species or its habitat, we provide we can do what's called a jeopardy opinion. The action will jeopardize the continued existence of that species, <laughs> and we have we can provide recommendations that the action agency must adopt or something to achieve a goal that, re that removes that jeopardy. But again, we're talking about the action, the action will jeopardize the continued existence of an endangered species. So that's very limited. The bigger issue which you've touched on is an action that threatens the sustainability, productivity, and profitability of the fishing industry. Right. Legally, we have no, there is no specific consultation requirement or opportunity that's legal, that's written in law, that gives us the authority to comment on that, that the agency must react to. Now, under the National Environmental Policy Act, every act, federal action has to do an environmental review. Usually it's an environmental impact statement for actions of this nature. We can provide comment to the action agency on their analysis, the information used, uh, and the selection of alternatives in terms of are there alternatives out there that would achieve their goals and objectives but have less of an impact on our trust resources and, and our fishing industry. So our where we've really focused in, in our regional office with BOEM on the wind projects in our area has been those two aspects. We want to make sure, one, that BOEM is using the best information possible and that they're using it correctly. That if they're going to, in their assessments, estimate the value of an area to the fishing industry, to commercial fishing or recreational fishing, that the information they're using is the right information at the right scale and that they're interpreting the data correctly. I know a year or so ago we looked at some information that BOEM was putting forward that uh, was based on vessel trip report data. 
and they were saying you know, if this was the, the ocean off of southern New England uh, and the wind energy area was going to go here, they would say, well, uh, the VTRs say that in this area uh, there's $3 million worth of, of, uh, of water, <coughs> and this is only 5% of that area, so we're going to assign 5% of $3 million and say that area is worth you know, that amount of money, 150000 And we said, well, time out. That's not how you use vessel trip report data. First of all, that's not the right scale of data for the area that you're looking at. We said, take a look at the vessel monitoring system data, which shows actual vessel tracks that can be discriminated to know when the vessel is fishing and when it is steaming. And using that information, you've picked, up, you've picked a hot spot for the squid fishery, and that's a $2.5 million annual impact to the squid fishery. So that's one way we work with BOEM, is to try to make sure that they're using the best information and that they're using it correctly. Um, we've worked closely with the fishing industry on that. Um, we are working with, I don't know if you've probably heard of Rhoda, uh, Responsible Offshore Development Alliance, uh, primarily started by fishing industry members, but also trying to be more inclusive. Um, we are engaged with them, looking for opportunities where we can provide assistance, primarily in terms of data and analysis. Um, and then the other, the other avid aspect that we do is, is commenting on the proposals by uh, BOEM and commenting on their work. So just last Friday, we uh, sent BOEM a uh, probably close to 30 page comment letter on their draft environmental impact statement for the Vineyard Wind Project, okay. where we raised a lot of concerns about uh, the quality of the analysis, the data used, uh, some of the assumptions. Uh, one example, an assumption that, well, if we're building this project here uh, and it's important to the squid fishery, that's not really a big deal because squid swim, and so the fishing industry will just move here and they'll fish for squid here. And we said, well, no, you're wrong on two points. One, this is, happens to be where there's a lot of lobster gear, and so you can't simply mm -hmm. displace a mobile gear fishery into a location where there's a, a significant fixed gear fishery. You're going to create gear conflicts, and it's, it's not practical. The other thing is understanding the biogeography of this place. Why does the fishery occur here? Mm -hmm. It occurs here because that's where the squid aggregate at certain times of year in sufficient Can density. Can invite them to move right there? <laughs> <they will? laughs> and so we have tried to um, work with them as, as another federal agency and help them understand better the impacts of the data that they should be using. But again, at the end of the day, unfortunately, BOEM is the decision maker and we are not. So our role is to provide advice and to provide assistance to BOEM. Um, and to hopefully be a venue for the fishing industry. And this is one thing I've tried to communicate in my meetings with industry that are really concerned about the impacts of wind, is to use us, come to us with your concerns. If you are aware of information that, the, that um, BOEM is, and the wind developers are not using, that they should be using, let us know. Uh, it may carry more weight for me to write a letter under my signature to BOEM than for each, you know, for a fisherman to write a letter. Uh, and I'm certainly willing to do that when there is information that BOEM should be considering or when they're misinterpreting the information that they have. But at the end of the day, uh, it's BOEM is driving this. And <coughs> so I, I hear what you're saying about sustainability, but does NOAA have concerns about the sustainability of the scallop industry given the plans, particularly for the area, was it off oh, of New York? Off New York, yeah. yeah uh, for offshore wind? I think it's difficult to say that we have concerns about the sustainability of a three to five hundred billion, you know, million dollar a year fishery. That, about the that damage to it. The damages could be significant. Okay. And we definitely have concerns about that. Um, I, I'm not less concerned about the overall long term sustainability of the fishery. Okay. But certainly um, we have concerns about the impacts of that particular area and how that could, that could play out. But one of the things we're learning as we go through this process is it's not necessarily just the area, but it's how the design, how the design of the project. So a project that is, you know, the orientation of the turbines 
is a certain direction, east-west versus north-south, um, if the spacing is sufficient, two miles versus a half mile, even within a given project area, those decisions can, at the end of the day, be the, be the factors that determine whether fishing can continue in an area or can't continue in an area. And so it's working with the industry to, to learn those things, to, to come to understand the, the decisions at the small scale that can affect um, you know, the profitability and the, and the product of the industry. And then working with BOEM so that they understand that as well and that they can work with their developers to better site and design these projects to minimize, to minimize the impacts on the industry. Can I ask why? Who makes decisions that certain areas are close to fishermen. So for instance, in the Bedford area, when it affects the whole community in terms of funds and all the people involved with the fishing boats when they can't go out. So there's, we have a number of, of closed areas off the, sh off co off the coast, uh, primarily to, to either um, protect um, endangered species or right whales in, in large part. We have, so we have seasonal closures uh, primarily for fixed gear. Uh, and then we have a number of habitat-based closures that are designed around uh, ident that we've gone through a long process to identify what we consider to be uh, the most productive and important and sensitive um, fish habitats and protecting those areas from uh, impacts of primarily mobile gear fishing so that those habitats can uh, be healthy and, and serve their function to uh, enhance fish productivity. So we do have a number of closed areas now. It's, I guess, a, not only an unfortunate fact, but it is a fact that um, those areas are not universal throughout the, the ocean. So there are certain areas that are much more valuable and important and sensitive as habitat for our fisheries and if, that, if an area happens to be off the coast of Gloucester, or off the coast of, uh, as, as is the Western Gulf of Maine closure area, or some of the areas that are closer to pro closer proximity to New Bedford, um, the habitat is where the habitat is, and we protect it where it is. And so those closures will have more of an impact on certain communities than others. But that's the nature of- that fish move. Fish move, but there, but we we spent a lot of time to make sure that the areas that are important as nursery grounds or um, uh, feeding grounds or reproductive, you know, re for reproduction, are the areas that we've closed to protect those areas from impacts. Okay, I just have one more question. There are, uh, now they're finding um, plastics out in certain fishing areas, mm -hmm. and. Um, is that your responsibility to monitor where that is? It's, you know, I wouldn't say it's our responsibility, but it's certainly something that we're the paying attention to. to be responsible to, to monitor? Well, it's certainly something that we're paying a lot of attention to. Uh, I think there is, you know, I'm, I'm starting to hear, and people are talking a lot more about microplastics That's now. That's the microplastics, Yeah, right. microplastics turning up in... Uh, Down here in the cell. Yep. And so that's something that we're paying attention to, to understand uh, the impacts to the resource, to understand potential human health impacts okay. from eating uh, fish that contain those, uh, and then working with other agencies such as EPA um, to look at ways that we can mitigate those impacts uh, so that we don't, those plastics don't end up in the water column ingested by fish. Can you talk before we wrap up, can you talk a little bit about warming waters and climate change and how bad <laughs> what you're seeing. If we have like two more topics for you, that sure. one, and really we also can't let you go without talking about the ground fish, the local ground fishing sector and Carlos Rafael and anything you might be able to talk about in the future. Okay, and I think you also wanted to talk about electronic <laughs> monitoring and uh, FC monitoring. Yeah, but so, so you have like 10 minutes left. Okay. <laughs> Let's try and get it so, on. <laughs> all right, so let's real, we'll real quick talk about uh, climate change, uh, warming waters. It's, it's a significant issue. I could probably, we could probably spend two hours talking about that. I think the concern is we're seeing trends um, going in a couple different ways. We're seeing some stocks that in the face of, of warming waters are probably going to be quite well off. Black sea bass we're seeing, I mean, there's a reason you're seeing black sea bass, 
blast off the coast of Maine now where you didn't see that 20 years ago. That stock is increasing. Uh, it seems to be quite happy with the warming waters and it's expanding its range. So we're seeing a lot of black sea bass that we didn't see before. So if you're a black sea bass fisherman, particularly from southern New England, you know, as long as, the, as long as we're able to keep up with the science and, and have those quotas uh, commensurate with the, the stock production, uh, you're going to be quite happy. Other stocks, the reverse trend, we're seeing reductions in productivity, uh, primarily from uh, cold water species. So the, the water is too warm, or is, the water is too warm for the primary prey of the species. Now, some of those fish are we're seeing lower pr productivity. Some they're moving. Cod would be one of those. Right, whether it's a lower pro productivity regime now that they're under uh, or they're moving out of U.S. waters, um, I think is somewhat of an open question. But the bottom line is, at least from what our science is telling us, there's fewer cod uh, and that they, they are being adversely affected by warming waters. Lower productivity being reproduction? Yes. So they're, they're reproducing later. Well, I like that term. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're reproducing later, they're, they're having fewer babies, uh, and they're not getting as, as big as quickly okay. uh, because they can't, primarily because they can't it's find food. It's more that than that they're moving. I think, well, I think that's unresolved. I think it's, it could be a combination of, of all of that. Right? There could be some moving into Canadian waters that are colder, um, so there's fewer cod here. The ones that are here are, uh, are basically under a lower productivity regime. So we're seeing several things happening. We're seeing stocks move, some north, some south, in response to, to warming waters. We're seeing some move offshore into deeper waters where, that are colder, some moving onshore, and some seeing changes in their overall product productivity. Some are more productive, some are less productive. And the councils and the agency are wrestling with those issues and how to respond. Um, we are starting to be able to read the signals in terms of how will climate change affect certain stocks. Uh, John Heron, who I know you've talked to, uh, was the principal author for uh, a climate change vulnerability assessment that the agency developed that identifies, at least in terms of the directionality and the severity of the response. It doesn't dictate how to respond, but it's just a, a metric that's used to identify, okay, if you're going to pay attention, pay attention to these six stocks because these are the ones that are most likely to have the most significant adverse response to climate change. And then the councils have that information to determine how they want to respond, either through um, <coughs> changing how they manage the fishery, what they're looking for, um, how much uh, precaution they use in, in terms of, of setting uh, catch limits. Uh, so that's basically where we are on climate change. We're watching it. It's affecting a lot of stuff. that's on my, because uh, uh, when fish disappear, um, what, what seems to get labeled on the fishermen negatively is that they're overfishing. Right. The fish aren't here because they're overfishing. And people look at the fishermen negatively saying you caught your own problem. Right. When in fact, it might not be overfishing. It might be environmental. That's the base interest of what I wonder if we can stay on college well, on the island. And yeah, okay, but I, but I, the time. So they can help with that label, that negative label on the fishermen by staying, raising that issue a yeah. little bit more. I, I, I would love to talk about If we have time, we can come back to that. Okay, that's um, fine. But I think one of the problems is it's an artifact of the act, the Magnuson Act that has two terms in it, overfishing and overfished. Uh, there have been some efforts to change overfished to depleted, um, but the term overfished is the sort of statutory definitional term for a stock that's below a certain level, regardless of whether it was caused by fishing or not. The term of the term of art in the in the law is overfished. I appreciate but, that. Um, okay, so Carlos. Car Carlos. So um, we're. Coming to the end of year 2018, uh, at the end of April, May 1st will be the beginning of uh, fishing year 2019. Um, as I understand it, and we haven't we haven't completed our rulemaking for the sector operations rule, uh, which is what authorizes the sectors to fish in 2019. Uh, there's two sectors last year. There was sector nine, sector seven. Uh, 
most of the vessels that had been in Car what we call Carlos's sector, sector nine, moved to sector seven. Um, sector nine had three permits in it uh, that was used primarily to pay back the remaining overages. Uh, the sector nine vessels that moved into sector seven, the agreement uh, put forward by the sector seven board was that that sector would effectively be lease only uh, in the sense that the uh, quota available to that sector from those permits could be leased out to other sectors, but that the vessels uh, that had been in Sector 9 that moved to Sector 7 uh, would be tied to the dock and remain inactive until they were sold to an independent third party and the permits were transferred. Uh, as far as I'm aware, that proposal has continued for 2019, although uh, Sector 9 is no more. Uh, the sector board or the, the three vessels permits that were in sector nine have moved to other sectors and so there will no longer be a sector nine. Sector seven would remain under the same um, proposal from last year but those vessels will it will be a lease only sector and that um, those vessels uh, if and when they're sold to a third party could then be reactivated within sector seven. And I think the, well, the, one, di the one distinction I want to make is we have what we call formal lease-only sectors. They're put forward as lease-only sectors. Uh, and if, a, if a, a vessel or a permit within that sector was to be reactivated uh, and to fish, the sector board would have to provide a brand new sector operations plan that was no longer a formal lease-only sector. Sector 7 didn't do that. They said, we're not going to call ourselves a lease-only sector, but we're effectively going to be a lease-only sector. That means that if they do reactivate a vessel, they don't need a new sector operations plan. They just send us, send us a letter requesting <coughs> that we reauthorize that vessel to fish and issue a letter of authorization. So the concern and the benefit is that once Carlos boats are sold, that, that those permits remain in the city. Uh, although there are certainly lots of people who don't live in the city that fish here. Right. Uh, um, what's, the, what's the status of, of the sale of that and what's going on regarding the tension between other communities who want those right. permits and, and them staying in your bed food? Right, so those, I mean, those are decisions that are not um, you know, within our authority uh, that we're not directly involved in. To the extent that we are aware that there is some interest from various parties in uh, some or all of Carlos's permits, I know that there, over the last year or so there have been a number of people that have uh, come forward saying, you know, we put together a package uh, provided you know, to, to, to buy some or all of Carlos's fleet. Um, we're supportive of those efforts because we would like to see those vessels uh, transferred out of Carlos's control and, and into others that are going to be good stewards and, and good participants in the fishery and, and we're looking forward to the day when all of the Carlos Rafael um, issues are behind us. Is it the court's decision? No. Whose decision is it as to? Well, a, a lot of it is, is Carlos. I mean, if, if, uh, if you were to say you wanted to buy a, a vessel from Carlos, you would go talk to Carlos and make him an offer and if he accepted it, you buy a but vessel. the court has to approve who he sells to, does it? No. 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 There were, I mean, there were a number of vessels that were seized, that were that were termed seized by the court. Those are under the you know jurisdiction of the court. Um, but the remaining vessels, most of the vessels, the large portion of his fleet, the vessels that were subject to the criminal complaint, and his and the other vessels, are not subject to court jurisdiction. So is, is there anyone influencing that except for Carlos as to who he wants to? There is, I would say, influencing, no. I mean, there is, so as you know, there were a number of additional charges on the civil side that were, that were released this year uh, and last year. Um, and so a lot of his permits are sort of within the umbrella of, of civil administrative uh, complaint and charges. But our NOAA enforcement side, so the enforcement attorneys and the enforcement office, is engaged with potential buyers to ensure that there are no, you know, if, if, a, if a citizen comes forward and purchases one or more vessels and permits from Carlos, that person doesn't want to 
inherit the civil charges, right? And potentially, see, uh, you know, fines, forfeiture, vessel sanctions. So our enforcement office is engaged with potential buyers to work out a settlement so that the transaction between Carlos and the buyer can alleviate and hold harmless the buyer. But that process involves Carlos because we're not simply going to let Carlos off by selling his fleet. There still are serious civil charges that need to be accounted for. Uh, and this, a settlement agreement, just like any court settlement agreement, will involve the parties. That, that sounds like that might be what's holding it up. He's waiting for. Is there a court process that needs to take place? There's not a, it's, it's not a court that? process. Right. It's, just a, okay. it's just a, typically, and I'm not a lawyer, and I don't work on the enforcement side, um, but you know, my understanding is that these settlement processes involve the lawyers for the various parties um, and the settlement agreements that uh, you know, a certain amount of uh, the transaction will hold harmless the buyer from any outstanding uh, civil charges, administrative charges, uh, and in, as part of that settlement agreement, say, um, for example, Carlos, uh, his estate would pay a certain amount of money towards a fine, and if it's sufficient to all parties, if that's the outcome, then the settlement agreement would be signed by all parties. The buyer would <coughs> have title to the vessel and the permits, uh, and the charges would be dismissed. I'm wondering, is there a scenario where Carlos could run out to these folks because he doesn't choose it not to sell? Like, I think, long term? I think that scenario is, exists. That's what we're There's nothing compelling him to, okay. to sell these vessels. If he tried to wait for a better scenario, somehow that might come down the right. pipe. And what's okay. the damage to the local? The damage is that those vessels are not fishing. That they're tied to the dock, so no one's buying ice. Quota no still one's. gets leased. The quota, the, the quota is available to okay. to be leased, um, but it's not just you know it's not just ground fish. Um, you know, Carlos owns scallop vessels, uh, vessels with a with a wide variety of permits that uh, that are affected. <coughs> and we were also going to talk about um, uh, electronic monitoring. Yep. Um, Okay, so is there a specific question, or do you just want me to talk about it in well, broad terms? Well, I mean, terms? we have great people have great hopes that that could be yep. a more precise measurement right. of what's out there. Yeah, less let, let, let costly as well, correct? Uh, well, it, 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 I think that's complicated. Well, I, think, I think, yeah, I mean, you know, this this question of cost is critically important because we don't want to develop a system that's not cost effective mm -hmm. for the industry. Um, but if you look at sort of trends in cost structures. Humans are not going to get cheap, right? Humans basically either stay, stay static or costs go up for every day that you have a human being on your boat monitoring. What we've seen, I think it's pretty safe to say, technology only gets cheaper. The cost of a camera, the cost of memory, um, the cost of storage uh, for, for data, it's all going down. It's going down dramatically. The capabilities of technology um, are increasing as well. And so in terms of a cost-benefit analysis, you could expect that um, for every day that you put a human observer on a vessel, the cost is, only, is either going to stay the same or increase over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, but if you replace that human observer with a camera system, um, those costs will go down certainly go down over the next 20 years. Um, I think all of us have been alive long enough to, you know, to go from comp the computing power of this, you know, dwarfs what I had on my desktop uh, 20 years ago. Unknown caller. Um, the cost of, of memory. Uh, you can go into Staples and buy a one terabyte memory stick that's this big um, that 10 years ago uh, would have been cost prohibitive and, and probably would have been a brick about this big that weighed 10 pounds uh, if it even existed. So in terms of what, you know, the fundamental technology behind electronic monitoring are cameras, um, transmission of data, and uh, data storage and data review. And the costs of at least three of those are on a downward trajectory. The data review 
is the process of reviewing the video from footage uh, and determining what information, how to, and translating that into the data that we need for stock assessments and fisheries management. Right now, that's primarily done from humans, and humans are expensive. But as I mentioned when talking about uh, the work that Kevin Stokesbury is doing, there's a lot of energy and resources being put towards automating that review and doing automated so facial recognition software, that type of approach where um, computers can automate the video review and identify uh, every fish to the species um, and develop a, a, a weight uh, or a length estimate which be, can be translated into a weight. And when we're, and that's going to significantly drive the cost of the systems down as well. So looking over the long-term horizon, uh, EM is the future if we want really cost-effective, reliable um, monitoring. The cost is up front. To, to there, are, there are certainly upfront costs for buying the system, and then there's back-end costs right. for paying for the review, paying for data storage, and then maintaining the systems. And is there resistance on privacy concerns also? Uh, there are, I mean, we've heard some of, yeah. some of that, but I think most of those can be overcome with a better understanding of how the cameras are positioned and what data is actually being reviewed. Um, so, yeah, I think we can overcome a lot of that resistance um, as we move forward and, and learn more about these systems. I, I, I was on the West Coast, just as an example. I was out in, in Alaska and I met with a fisherman out there um, who was so excited to show me his camera system and tell me how excited he was to have EM rather than human observers. Um, and he said, you know, just my own peace of mind of, of that there's not another person I have to be responsible for on my vessel, mm -hmm. that I have to be aware of where are they, what are they up to, what's going on, what's, what's, what are they, you know, uh, what's near them, what might happen to them. He said, frankly, um, the, this, you know, having, uh, not knowing whether the observer is going to show up, it's going to be mm -hmm. a man or a woman, and I've got to worry about my crew and the safety of the observer. Um, that, that was a concern. Uh, he said, you know, I can wake up one day and look out and say, man, it's going to be a good day today. And I could be fishing in an hour because I can simply turn the cameras on and I'm gone versus having to call in and say, I want to go fishing tomorrow or two days from now and hope that an observer shows up. And so a timeline. So timelines associated with that, um, the safety, the number of people that are on board, um, and then there's the reliability of the data. If you've got, you know, a two, three, five day trip, the cameras don't sleep. Human observers need to sleep. So you, you el eliminate a lot of limitations of human observers. There are still issues, right? I mean, cameras can't look and see whether it's a male or a female. They can't weigh every fish. They can't measure the fish. They can't think, uh, cameras can't distinguish between certain species of flatfish that are very hard to tell apart or certain species of skates that are very hard to tell apart. So there are limitations of the cameras, but I think those those are technological limitations that we'll overcome. I have a timeline until it's implemented. Oh, timeline. Well, we're implementing it now. We have uh, several sectors that are working, uh, that are using EM as an alternative to ASCII monitors. Uh, some sectors are using 100% uh, EM. Some sectors are using it uh, instead of when they're when they're selected for an ASCII monitor, they turn the cameras on for those trips. Um, and so I think we have you know a couple dozen, two to three dozen vessels <coughs> that are either using this or interested in using this system instead of ASCII monitors. I think we'll start to see those numbers increase uh, as we get more experience with it. Uh, but what we're talking about in terms of full-scale implementation, uh, I think we're still several years away. Uh, first of all, it's not, a, it's not a requirement. It's simply an alternative uh, for, for sectors if they're interested in that. And uh, the New England Council is working uh, very hard on Amendment 23, which is this kind of wholesale re-looking at uh, how we're monitoring the ground fish fishery to ensure accountability. I think EM will be a piece of that, whether it will be the final decision of the council to mandate electronic monitoring as, instead of human observers, I'm not sure, it's too early to tell. But certainly I think that um, EM will be part of the conversation and part of the discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks. It's just been terrific, uh, really uh, very helpful to us. Uh,